Welcome to Spirits Podcast, episode 52, NBA Conspiracies, with Mike Schubert and Eric Silver and Eric Schneider. I know what you're thinking. Who are all these men? Or why NBA Conspiracies? What does that even mean? The word conspiracies is like, okay, partial spirits territory, but you're like, NBA, I don't know what those letters are. I'm worried if you don't know what those letters are. Listen, uh, th- this is the deal, y'all. It's Thanksgiving week. We're busy. We're busy. Julia's pie. cooking a bunch. I'm making blueberry, brown sugar, like caramel bars. Cool. I'm very excited about it. We've been doing weekly spirits for a month and a half. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot. We're tired. Yeah. And so we thought, it, let's just let's just like go to a brewery and taste a bunch of flights of beer mm-hmm. and let the boys take over. The boys can just do it this week. We don't care. Actually, what happened is Mike Schubert and Eric Silver yelled at us for a year about wanting to do a sports episode. And so here we are. Yes. But it is a nice break for us because we didn't have to record this whole episode. It is. And it's about uh, very, very contemporary uh, conspiracy theories. Mm-hmm. And two very interesting ones where, where there's like video evidence. There's like actual stuff to look at. It's it's way more like searchable than most of the stuff we talk about, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, it's actually super interesting. I never was invested in sports so much as right. listening to Mike rant about cold envelopes yeah and now we know what that means yeah Uh, i also think it would be a great euphemism for pretty much anything you wanted so i genuinely think that you guys are gonna enjoy this episode and i know that i enjoyed listening to it um so thank you to the guys for taking over for the week and um julia why don't you tell us about our sponsor for the week we are sponsored by central curios it is a wand making store um our good friend aaron uh has sponsored with us before our uh, first ever sponsor no god bless you Aaron. amazing long-term listeners will know that aaron was our first ever sponsor uh we are so thankful to him we love his stuff he is sending us wands julia and i could not be more excited yeah and we'll tell you a little bit more about that but you can get 10 percent off at centralcurios.com with the code spirits I know. They're beautiful wands, beautiful gifts. If you order now, you can get them in time for the holidays. Awesome, awesome stuff. We would also love to thank our newest patrons, Kendra, Annika, Bashra, and Alex, as well as our supporting producer-level patrons, Neil, Chandra, Philip, Dylan, Julie, Sarah, Christina, Robert, Lindsay, JST, Sandra, ER, Deborah, Kimo, Phil, Ryan, Catherine. You guys are the Scotty Pippins to our Michael Jordans. You guys will understand what that means in a bit. It's awesome. And also, uh, thank you to our legend level patrons, Leanne, Cassie, Cammy, Shannon, Aaron, and Ashley, who got their first box of spirits, swag, physical, actual stuff from us, like Mm -hmm. gifts. Like you're going to give each other gifts for the holidays, but it's gifts to you. It's so nice. And you'll be getting one more box before the holidays. There's one every single month. If you donate at the legend level at patreon.com slash spirits podcast. You should do it. We got some cool stuff next month. We actually just uh, picked them out. Oh, yeah, week. we did. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I have half of it and we're waiting for the other half to arrive. It's really stoked. awesome. It's like online shopping, but I don't have to feel guilty because it's for you. Yeah, it's for you guys. Two more quick things. One is that our merch distributor, DFTBA, is having a 20% off everything sale for Black Friday. Sweet. So if you go to DFTBA.com or spiritspodcast.com slash merch, you can go there and get our t-shirt and our pin set. So if you've been waiting uh, for a sale or just for your paycheck to come in or the right moment, now's the right moment to get that creepy cool t-shirt. This is the moment. And do you know what would be a great moment to meet us in the flesh? I do know that moment. And when that is, is 4 30 on Saturday in Seattle at PodCon. On December 9th. We will be there. We'll be doing panels. We'll be meeting you in the flesh. We'll be giving out the dopest of swag. Such cool swag. And I'm really stoked to see some of you there. Yeah. We're going to be there with a bunch of cool audio drama creators. We're going to be there with Join the Party, What's the Frequency, Greater Boston, Our Fair City, uh, and a bunch of others that are just too many to list. There's like a whole beautiful grid of, of podcast cover art, and it is lovely. It is. It's very pretty. Well, we wish that all of you here in the States have a very happy Thanksgiving and the rest of you have a a very nice Wednesday and then Thursday and then Friday and then rest of your lives. And we will be seeing you next week with a whole new episode. We love you guys. We're thankful for you. Oh, we are. We are. And now enjoy Spirits Podcast episode 52, NBA Conspiracies with Mike Schubert and Eric Silver. Welcome to My Eric, My Eric and Me. I'm your oldest Eric, Eric Hamilton Schneider. I'm your middlest Eric, Eric Lawrence Silver. And I'm your sweet baby Eric, Mike Schubert. (laughs) Today on (laughs) Spirits Podcast. (laughs) Oh, that gave me so much joy. (laughs) We've got something different for you. It's My Eric, My Eric and Me, where Mm -hmm. Mike Schubert will be... Hello. 
playing the role of Julia and <laughs> doing a uh, um, a basketball conspiracy story or multiple stories for us, if I understand correctly. Yes, we will have two NBA conspiracy theories that uh, are only, in my mind, conspiracy theories in title because I believe they are 100% fact and they certainly happened. And I'll be playing the role of Amanda. Uh, I'm going to care only about capitalism, and I'm going to side on the side of the owners. And I think that I'm just going to, you know, <laughs> give the counterpoint and just like, yeah, the free market, the 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 hand of the market, like really deserves to play some b-ball outside the school. <laughs> I don't think Eric's ever listened to spirits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought you were going to say I'm going to be playing the role of Amanda. I won't understand any pop culture reference made, but oh, you that know, too. capitalism is also a choice. <laughs> and I'll be playing the role of myself dreading editing this in a couple weeks. Oh, so good. I'm so well, excited. Well, here's the it. thing. We're not going to talk about dicks. Like we promised we won't talk about dicks for like a lot. Because it's not even like, it's not like mythological dicks. Like, these are like real people I've seen on television. And I'm not just going to be like, you know, like Michael Jordan's dong. Like, you know, he's just like, you know, Zeus's dong. Oh, that's no. I mean, th there's a very good chance we will still do a Harry Potter tangent due to Mike hosting a Harry Potter <laughs> Wait, uh, what's podcast. That? It, is that true? Mike Schubert, me, hosts a podcast called Potterless? Boo, where no, we're not doing plugs. <laughs> no, no plugs. No plugs yet. <laughs> I, I opened it right up. So let's let's talk about this first myth. Or yeah. I guess I'm used to hearing the word myth. Let's talk about this first conspiracy. <laughs> so this first conspiracy is the 1985 NBA draft lottery conspiracy, a.k.a. the frozen envelope. So the year is 1985. The NBA is in a very interesting situation where they are gaining popularity, but uh, they are losing money. And one of their main revenue streams is through television deals. And their contract with CBS is set to end in 1986. So this upcoming season for them is very important. And what they have instituted this year is the NBA draft lottery. So normally... Ba, 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 da, da, ba, ba, ba. Sorry, I, just, oh, I needed just to do that's, Well, that's NBA on NB, that's NBA NBC, not CBS. <laughs> oh, so that's well. more in the 90s. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to be a part of the story, Shoobs. Wrong no, theme. no, please also please interrupt as much as you can. I'm just going to be <laughs> spitballing the truth. Please interject. It's more fun that way. Well, I just want to say that the frozen envelope is very spirits esque. Oh, sounding. yeah. It's so, so we're, good. We're off to a great start. Oh, yeah. It's a great name for it. Um, I'm also going to like backtrack a bit for something that makes more sense. So here's editing. I'll talk about why it's important that they're good before I get into how the lottery works. Can you um, mispronounce so the name frozen envelope so you just like really get Julia? <laughs> Got him! The this is what you get for not envelope. showing up to your recording session. <laughs> <laughs> so, the frozen envelope. Uh, okay. It's very important that the NBA is successful this year so that CBS wants to renew their TV contract. And the most surefire way for them to renew it is for them to have great TV ratings. The easiest way to do that is to have all the teams that are in big cities be good at basketball because then more people want to watch them. And this is in the 80s, very different than today, where with all the streaming and NBA League Pass, you can watch any team you want at any time, no matter where you live. And you can have a very good team in a not important city. Exactly. Like Oklahoma City. They're going to be very solid. And there is nothing to do in Oklahoma City, I'm pretty sure. Um, it's what? Maybe 12 people live there? <laughs> it's Russell Westbrook at 11. I was just, I was kind of opening up a way for you to insult Cleveland. But oh, you, I mean, you did it a different way. No, so yeah. like, I'll, ta I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, I just try to pretend Cleveland doesn't exist because I don't like LeBron. Anyway. Uh, wait, hold on. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Hold on a second. This is I also. Can't, I can't believe I agreed to do this. <laughs> <laughs> this is also coming off the early 80s when, like, the Blazers were really good and they had Bill Walton, right? Wasn't that the early 80s? I believe that's when they were solid, yeah. But really, the 80s, what really rose them to fame was the Larry Bird Celtics and the Magic Johnson right, right. Lakers, the Showtime Lakers. That was the big, that was what really drove the popularity in the 80s. But, uh, so as I mentioned, the Boston, Boston Celtics, very good, major market. Los Angeles Lakers, very good, major market. New York Knicks, major market, complete garbage sauce. Absolute Garbage sauce, not dissimilar from how yeah, they shoot, are now. I was just going to ask. <laughs> my, I was like, hey, how my bad? My beloved New York Knicks are horrible, but I my, love them Mike with all of my heart. is currently wearing a New York Knicks jersey and hat, I think. I'm wearing a New York Knicks jersey, hat, underwear, and socks. So oh, <laughs> <laughs> I am ready for this podcast. Uh, 
So it is very, it is in the NBA's best interest for the Knicks to be good. And thankfully, uh, going into the 1985 season, they were one of the worst seven teams in the NBA. And here is why. At the beginning of the 1985 season, they uh, instituted the first ever NBA draft lottery. Now, for years, they had the NBA draft, which is similar to other sports drafts where the worst teams get the best picks so that they can become better, parity can exist in the league, etc. So you don't have, you know, the same bad teams being bad forever. The way it used to work, though, was that the, the worst two teams in the league did a coin flip for the number one pick, and then... You know, those are ranked one, two, and then the third worst, the third worst team got the third pick, the fourth worst team got the fourth pick, etc. Listen, but with wait, this, cre- listen, I wouldn't yeah. even What's flip uh, a coin to like decide which uh, cookie or like side of the cookie I would share with my brother. Like we're talking about millions of dollars, and they're like, "Yeah, does anyone have a penny? Mm-hmm. Like, can we just like flip? Like, is that fine?" <laughs> God, this is like, <laughs> yeah, then, then you got to like do all this crazy conspiracy stuff to make up for the fact that they didn't plan in the future that someone's actually going to make money off of this. It just like doesn't make any sense. So the problem with this coin flip model is that the teams that knew they weren't going to make the playoffs uh, would try to lose games on purpose so they that they could try to get a better pick. And by lose games on purpose... Uh, what they would do is they would sit some of their best players and say they had injuries, even though they really didn't, or they would do trades that would trade away their best players for either young people or draft picks or whatever. And it basically would just make the, the last third of the NBA season really boring for a bunch of the teams. So to combat this, they created the NBA draft lottery. The way that this worked in 1985 was the bottom seven teams all had an equal chance of getting the number one draft pick. So every team that did not make the playoffs had a chance of getting the number one draft pick. So the way that they set it up, it was a live televised event and they had this giant plastic sphere, kind of like a bingo ball sphere. And this is every, this is the point in time where anyone listening to the podcast should go to the YouTube link in the show notes uh, that contains the video of this draft lottery because it is... A absolutely hilarious video, and it will kind of help uh, my narration help you understand. So we've got the bot- these bottom seven teams. They mm-hmm. are all in the. They're all in this ball, or other teams in this giant ball as well. It is just the bottom seven teams that didn't make just, the playoffs. So, and then we're eventually going to get to an envelope. So we've got a bunch of balls going down. Or no, so we, we have one giant sphere that's like a bingo ball like thing. Giant like one giant yes. like one of those things with a crank that spins bingo right. ball numbers. Oh, and there's probably envelopes. And there's going to be envelopes and then inside. And the of players it, yes. get inside and then they all like kind of like have to like push each other to like <laughs> It's like a King of the Hill situation. Yeah, the number one draft picks all yeah. jump in. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, yes, speaking of the number one draft pick, this draft was very important because there was one player who was far and above any other person going into the draft. And LeBron his James. Name, no. Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> that would have been 2003. Knows Shaquille. <laughs> no, I, I know. Shaquille Jeremy O'Neal. The, no, the, the consensus number one pick is Patrick Ewing. Patrick Ewing uh, just graduated from Georgetown University. He had four amazing years there. He made the NCAA Finals three times, won it once, and his senior year won College Player of the Year. Like He was uh, easily the best player in the draft, so much better than all of the other ones. Uh, so if you got the number one pick, it was life-changing, and if you didn't, you had some people that weren't that great. Uh, let me list off the names of the other people that went after Patrick yes. Ewing in this draft, and you can tell me if you recognize uh, any pro- of them. I'm going to, so, and I'll tell them the the places. That so I'm I don't I don't recognize the name Patrick Ewing. No, so I, it's oh, Eric. Oh, oh, I I mean oh. it, it sounds like it sounds like vaguely familiar, but to be oh. fair, none of us were alive when this happened. So like it shouldn't be shocking. But that he I was don't good until the year 2000. Yeah, he played for a really long time. Yeah, he yeah, played for a really I, long time. Yeah, but I was playing video games up until then. Yeah, well, did you not play NBA Jam? Because he was one of the best players at NBA Jam. He's the guy who has like knee pads and a and a high top fade. Number thirty three. Oh, he's so good. Uh, I didn't play a lot. This of is when Tubes and I have our oh. own podcast within a podcast where we just talk about NBA Jam. <laughs> 
and it's oh called the God, Slam Jam. The Dream. So here, here are the people that got drafted after Patrick Ewing. You, do, I didn't even recognize these names, and I'm terribly obsessed with basketball. Wayman Tisdale, Benoit Benjamin, My Xavier Xavier McDaniel, and John Concac. Ben, what was that guy? Benoit <laughs> so Benjamin. Love those guys. Benoit Benjamin. Benoit Benjamin sounds <laughs> yeah. like um, you're trying to sneak into a party. <laughs> And you you have to give a fake name because like you don't want people to know you're going to a party. You're like, uh, my name's uh, Benoit, uh, Benoit Benjamin. Yeah, yeah, I'm Benoit. Yeah, he's so bad. I clicked on his Wikipedia page. He doesn't have a picture. He lasted three years in the NBA. <laughs> they don't even list his career statistics. So. Oof. That, that's harsh. All right. That's harsh. <laughs> so I don't think he was very good at basketball. So it's very important uh, that the that you win this draft. And the NBA has a se- se- severe vested interest in the New York Knicks winning this draft because they will get Patrick Ewing. They will be very good immediately and for years. Yeah, well, to hold come. on. All right. I have to, I'm going to do the, my I'm going to do some Amanda shit right now. So mm-hmm. what's crazy about all of this is that sports are inherently like make stories they're myth making like people do it as a relationship between people and the reason why it's such a big deal is because people want to watch it on tv and the economics are behind that so but when the economics the business of sports goes ahead of the actual things we love about sports which is that everyone has a shot everyone loves their home team and everyone might actually win a championship like it, it ruins the story. It ruins the whole reason why we care about sports in the first place. And that's what's so crazy about these. It's people putting business, the business of the NBA, ahead of the actual people who care about the NBA. Yeah. I mean, it sucks if you are not a New York Knicks fan like I am. Like, I love this story. It's great. <laughs> Because <laughs> we get, we get, spoiler alert, we get Patrick Ewing in the no, end. No, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> you ruined it. <laughs> so, uh, so we get to the actual event itself. And this is the part where I'd say, everyone go to the show notes, watch the video, because my narration will be great, but the video will help you along. So you've got this guy by the name of Jack Wagner who is a lawyer that works for Ernst & Winnie. And this is a, a fun conspiracy theory note because he works, that's a, a firm that was the auditing firm of Gulf and Western who owned the New York Knicks at the time. So this is like extreme yarn stretching like to connect him to the Knicks, which is probably complete coincidence, but I love bringing it up because it's a conspiracy theory. <laughs> that definitely seems like a weird conflict of interest. Yeah, he's got a vague tie to the Nick. It also doesn't make any sense why you bring in a lawyer to handle the envelopes and not someone that works for the NBA. Like, it was very strange. But isn't that no different than, like, at the Oscars? I guess, like, yeah. Any award show where they have, like, people, it comes out of, like, an armored car? There's armored it's, cars no, at the Oscars? They always show the I'm armored car. I'm pretty sure the, envel- the envelopes are always, like, uh, super, Oh, like, you're right, secure. you're right. The envelopes being handled by a... Lo- okay, that makes way more sense than what I was thinking. Okay. I don't care that it's security theater. Like, they can wave it over with, like, a TSA wand to make sure that it's the right thing. And I'd be so ready for it. I'm like, oh, man, these awards are so secure. I'm finally going to know the Tony for, like, best supporting actress <laughs> in a play or drama off-Broadway. Thank you for keeping that for me, Lin-Manuel. <laughs> I always assume that Lib Bangle Miranda is involved in the Tonys too. Like he's sitting in the I mean, he, well. he should be. So Jack Wagner has seven envelopes, and these are comically large envelopes. Uh, and each envelope contains a picture of the logo of the seven NBA teams. And he approaches the giant plastic sphere, which has this big metal rod running through the middle of it that helps crank the sphere around. Now, is this stuff all just big to a normal person and average size to the standard NBA player? <laughs> like, because you're saying it's very large, but, like, most of the people in the NBA are very large. But, like, most people aren't. So is it – how – what's what's the real perspective here? Are we talking, um, like, three see. times the size it should be? Because that's far too large. I have the video pulled up right now, and on the stand and everything, like, it comes up to this guy's torso, so it would probably come up to an NBA player's – like hip if i had to guess i would say that like the 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 diameter of this sphere is probably like five feet it's pretty large that seems large it's like it's basically the size of like a big inflatable beach ball oh wow like one of the huge ones at a concert and it's that with giant envelopes in them and those are actually giant like bigger than your head tubes just watch the video in the show notes shaquille (laughs) o'neal was holding one of these envelopes could he fit the whole envelope in his mouth at the same time but 
No. How many envelopes could we fit <laughs> on the pi- the head pin of a needle? If Shaquille O'Neal had five envelopes in one hand <laughs> and two envelopes in the other hand, how many envelopes could he put in his mouth? He'd have seven envelopes. He has seven envelopes. <laughs> okay, so so I assume Sorry. what happens next is they oh they pull an envelope out. Oh no no no! You're you're missing some of the oh, best parts. <laughs> okay. Oh, so wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it gets so good. So there's this like metal rod in the middle of it, and he uh, Jack Wagner puts the first three envelopes under that metal so he opens the little latch to the sphere and he just very gingerly drops three envelopes out of harm's way of this metal rod he takes the fourth one and he like Yu-Gi-Oh! heart of the cards it like (laughs) against the middle against the rod like he like flings this thing at the middle rod for no reason i mean other than we will reveal later so he like flings it at the rod so it like hits it and it, and it, like, flops around, so it, like, dents, like, the side of it. And then when it lands, it lands on the corner. So this envelope now has a folded corner. And then he puts in the other, the remaining three envelopes, just like he did for the other ones, very gingerly. Mm. Or the, the remaining, yeah. So, so it seems, see what's happening it's here. very suspect that all of the envelopes were put in one way, except for one, and it's going to come up later. Well, so thing, well, like, at this th- point. This is like a, it's like oh, a can, bingo um, like a bingo, I don't know, what do you, man, I, yeah, you know how yeah, I it's a thing that has all the bingo balls bingo. Um, it's like, uh, one of those bingo wheels where it's like, you need, it, it like yeah. gets stirred around like a KitchenAid mixer, but like he only threw one, mm-hmm. like in the actual mixing portion while the other ones could get stuck to the sides of the plastic ball, right? Uh, I mean, not really. The, the The issue is not where he placed them. It's just how he placed that one because he put it in much more violently, which you would think is done to some somehow like dent or fold that envelope so it stands out from the rest. The, when he flips the rest of them, they all pretty much got get it, shuffled around um, about as well as a bunch of envelopes can. So it's it's less about where he placed it and more that he like banged it against the middle for no reason. And that was the only one of the seven that he did that for. So it's not like it slipped or something. It was, it seems very intentional when you watch the video. Cause it's just so strange. There's a counter <laughs> so... conspiracy theory that Jack Wagner is also a lizard person, but that's a whole other thing. That's a different episode. Different episode. <laughs> that's a whole nother. You'll have to watch on the net. Yeah. That'll be the next episode. Screen. That's part two, part two <laughs> so... where I debunk all of this. because That's lizard yeah, that's... people. <laughs> That that could be the that could be the patron bonus episode this month. It's like, all right, this is lizard people. lizard people. All right, so here's the thing: the NBA is all run by lizard people. <laughs> Shaquille O'Neal, lizard person. Have you seen the size of his hands? <laughs> it's the only it's the only possibility. I'm recording this in Amanda's uh, apartment right now, and I'd like to think that I snuck back in to like do this in, like the middle of the night, and like Amanda come walks in halfway through, and she's like, "Eric, what are you doing?" I was like, <laughs> "I'm recording." people episode what do you think i'm doing (laughs) oh man so so he closes the latch to the big sphere and then grabs the crank and then mixes up all the envelopes while this is going on david stern the commissioner of the nba is standing off to the side staring at the sphere (laughs) incredibly intently like he looks so serious and uncomfortable it's great which you'd have no reason to do this unless you had a specific goal in mind which was pick a particular i think it's also important to talk about what david stern looks like uh, David Stern looks like a vice principal with way too much power. <laughs> yeah. Accurate. So he's just like, he's very... David Stern, also one of the shadiest men so ever shady. in history. Like, he's looking out for a reason to, like, get you lose your um, off-campus lunch privileges. So it's like, if he is looking Ooh, intently yeah. at something, it's dangerous. Definitely. So he's looking super intensely at the sphere. Jack Wagner finishes spinning him around. David Stern approaches the sphere and opens the latch. Now, the way that the envelopes are kind of shuffled around, there are three envelopes stacked on top of each other, pretty close to the opening uh, of the latch to the sphere. So you think he's going to just probably grab the one that's on top, you know, like a human. But what David Stern does is he grabs those three that are all stacked, and then he flips them all over, like in one motion. So the one that is on the bottom is now on the top. He then grabs that one off the top, holds it to the audience, to the cameras, and says, the team's logo that is within this envelope will have the number one pick to the 1985 NBA draft. And, of course, if you watch the video, and the camera's, like, right up on the side, and you can see it. It is so easy. You can see the folded corner of the envelope. So when Jack put it, put it in violently, it very much made one of the corners very folded in that envelope. 
uh, and that's the one that David Cern ends up picking with this weird maneuver. Like, no one does that. It's not like he just stuck his hand in and shuffled them around or, like, dispersed them when you're normally grabbing he a piece of paper. Three, he grabs three. Yeah. It's so weird. Like, no person on earth would ever do it. So he, like, grabs three, flips them, takes that one, holds it up. It happens to be the one with the folded corner, and it also happens to contain the New York Knicks logo, <sighs> meaning they win the 1985 NBA draft lottery. They get Patrick Ewing, and they go on to be very competitive for the next 15 years, but win zero NBA championships. <laughs> Ain't nobody so, can stop I mean, me now, because I'm on my way. <laughs> <laughs> so why is it called the frozen envelope? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say people are probably wondering. There's no freezing part in this. So there, when this I was happened, expecting it <laughs> frozen in air or like some kind of ice demon was involved. Oh, of course, yes, naturally, <laughs> like some kind, some kind of mythological freezing issue. You cut so out the whole part where there, David Stern uses his um, ice powers to blind everyone in the audience, and then he grabs the thing. Oh right, I forgot, I forgot. Yeah, it shows up really clearly so, on the tape. It's very weird. It might be doctored. I don't know. It's like 1980s. <laughs> when the Knicks won this, a lot of people thought this was BS. Like, a lot of people thought that there was some sort of uh, foul play involved. So one of the theories that developed was that prior to bringing out the envelopes, they had put the Knicks envelope in the freezer not long enough where it had condensation around it, but long enough where it would be cold to the touch so that when David Stern was feeling around and grabbing the envelopes he would know which one was the Knicks's because it would be cold. Now, I don't think this is true because of the flip maneuver. It wasn't like he touched every envelope. He just, like, flipped those three, so it seemed more like he went for the folded corner. But frozen envelope just sounds way cooler than the dented and folded corner envelope of the bingo sphere. Like, I mean, it's it's possible he was just like... Now, what if... what if, Like, he was trying to feel all three envelopes, so he grabbed three of them. Mm -hmm. Maybe his thumb felt some coldness. The exactly. The real question is, what if none of those were cold? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> then, the thing. Like, is, that does he just kind of take bad. them and like toss them aside gently and go checking out the other four? Maybe one of mm -hmm. these is, is the cold <laughs> envelope. Yes. Now, you could say that, that the frozen was to be like, there's two ways to check. So either one will be dented if Jack successfully hits it on the middle thing, or it'll be frozen. So there's like two ways to figure it out. But regardless, it's just pretty much forever known as the frozen envelope, because as you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, it's just got a dope name and it sounds super cool. I feel like this uh, anything affiliated with the NBA still needs a cool name. Also, the frozen envelope sounds oh, like yeah. uh, a street ball player nickname. Oh yeah, Jimmy the Frozen yeah, Envelope like, Smith. Like it's a combination yeah. of Iceman <laughs> and um and the Mailman. So it's just like they're you're combining oh, yes. you run out of nicknames, so they're combining two <laughs> two real NBA nicknames together. <laughs> it's like how they come up with the horse racing names because you can you can't have oh, two yeah. horses name the same thing in all of the history of horse racing, which is why you get crazy. Wait, horse that's names. why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a yeah, combination yeah. of the mom and dad oh horse God. or whatever. So now, well, yeah, yeah, so like, yeah, I, we don't need to get into horses. We don't want to be too much like my brother, my brother and me. So now I need to start. I got to go out and I got to get a filly named Blue Eyes and a mare called White Dragon and then put them together. Yep. This is a very long con so I can have a Yu-Gi-Oh inspired. <laughs> no, it's a good joke. Inspired horse race. <laughs> Excuse me. I have to, we have to postpone the podcast. My favorite horse race name that I ever heard was uh, Hoof. Hearted, so hoof hearted. Uh, so when the announcer says it really fast, it sounds like, oh, who farted, who farted, who farted. Oh, so good. Whoever came up with that name is uh, a who genius. farted by two lengths was really funny in the locker room later. <laughs> So yeah, that is the frozen envelope NBA conspiracy, which is probably one of the most widely accepted and believed to be true theories and my personal favorite. Now, if I'm looking at the clock, it looks like it's halftime. So I think we should go <laughs> get some concessions oh and we'll God. be right back. We'll be right back. Eric, we'll be right back pencil, after this. Oh, hey, we're back. Hey, we checked in to make sure that the house hadn't burned down because we let the kids use the stove and, and we're actually okay. It seemed like it's okay. They went and got some soft pretzels. We're fine. We're, we're fine so far. An overpriced beer, but like hopefully they bring back more for us. Uh, more beer is always good. Uh, this week, we are sponsored by Central Curios. Aaron, 
our good, good friend makes every wand himself and they are all real wood and naturally finished. So there are no artificial colors or dyes. He's just really good at finding cool exotic woods to use. Yeah. And these like, listen, y'all, I've been in Harry Potter fandom for a long time. I never bought a wand because I thought like, oh, I'm not going to get a plastic one. I'm not going to go to Disney and like spend another like hundred plus dollars. Like that's just, it's just a lot. It's universal, but okay. That one too. The one in Florida. Mm -hmm. Uh, But Listen, if you can like support a, you know, independent craftsperson, if you can buy this incredible, you know, piece of art that is matched to your personality, like he'll ask you what house you're in, like what kind of stone you want, what kind of wood is right for you. Um, I am totally into that. And I'm lucky because Aaron is going to send us some wands and I'm really excited about it. And honestly, Aaron does some really cool work. He does uh, hand carving. He does wood burning. He does stone inlay. He did this really cool wand that I saw on his Instagram which you should definitely check out at Central Central Curious. Curious. Um, And it is just, it's inlay with malachite, which is just (gasps) like bright green stone. It's super, super cool. But basically every wand he makes is totally unique. He never remakes a wand. Every wand is made to order and made specifically for you. He'll even send you a certificate of authenticity that talks about the wand lore and why the wand's individual personality is unique to you. I'm actually kind of mad that Aaron is sponsoring us this week because this would have been a really good holiday gift for you, Julia. And I, I completely slept on it. Honestly, Aaron kind of puts Ollivander to shame. I'm going to say it right now. I know. It's pretty fucking cool. He I know. He does some great stuff. Because like Ollivander, they all look pretty much the same, right? Like it's just a wood. It's just yeah. variable lengths. And this one, you can get a holder. You can get a stand. You can get stone. You can get all kinds of amazing stuff. You guys really don't have to see it for yourselves. It's like a whole nother level. Mm-hmm. So he is at Central Curios on Instagram. And you can get 10% off your order in time for the holidays or afterward or treating yourself or your birthday or whatever, winter solstice, if you use the code SPIRITS at centralcurios.com. Yep, 10% off. Uh, and you get one of over 500 different wands that Aaron's made. So he's basically a wand expert at this point. I know, it's amazing. And really, even if you just follow his Instagram, it is completely worth doing. So thank you so much to Aaron, our very first sponsor, for bringing things home as we round on our second anniversary. We really do appreciate it. Oh, and Aaron, congrats on your engagement. Yay, everyone's getting married. It's very happy. It's great. Good. Well, uh, Jules, I think that the, the call of the void returns. We have to go back to the brewery. Maybe, oh, can we get some barbecue right now oh my god barbecue (gasps) yes please okay let's turn the mic back over to the boys and get back to the episode so mike what is our next nba conspiracy myth that we've got our next basketball conspiracy revolves around the first retirement of michael jordan who is the greatest basketball player to ever live before (laughs) eric asks who's michael jordan (laughs) i'm sorry who's mike michael jorbin i don't i don't hear the who is who you talking about (laughs) Uh, This joke is terrible. (laughs) Terrible every time he does it. So you guys may know Michael Jordan as the best basketball player to ever live. You also may know him from Oscar snub film Space Jam, which is the greatest (laughs) piece of modern cinema to ever exist. It's a good film, but a better website. Uh, Wait, what website? Come come on and dot am. No, no, no. The Space Jam website is still up to this day, and it has not changed since like 1995. Uh. Yeah, I thought you were referring to come on and sl.am, which just has Charles Barkley's face flying across the screen with 20 different Space Jam theme song remixes that play at random. Michael Jordan. Now, many people will know that he's the greatest basketball player to ever live. What some people don't know is that he is easily the most prolific gambler of modern sports. He betted, he gambled on anything and everything. And there's two stories that really stand out about it. The first of which is, you know how at sports games, um, they'll do those things on the screen where where there will be like a boat race or a subway race and it's all computer graphic and and the audience has to decide, you know, oh, I think the D train is going to win or like, I think the blue boat is going to win or whatever. So those are always like randomly generated. But Michael Jordan during pregame would talk to the guy running the video board and he'd be like, hey, which train is going to win the subway race? And the guy would be like, oh, the B train. And then during a timeout when they play it, he would turn to Scottie Pippen and he'd be like, yo, I bet you $500 the B train wins. And then Scottie would be like, you're on. And he did that to Scottie Pippen for an entire season before Scottie caught on (laughs) that he was cheating every single time. So wait, he won every single time. Every single time. You think after three, 
Pippen would just be like... Scottie Pippen's notoriously you know not one of the brightest NBA players, but also maybe he spaced it out where he didn't do it every game. And that's, he, wait, that's who was, uh, <laughs> This is important. There are a lot of games in the NBA. Yeah, it would be there's impressive. 82. He was trying to make like $500 every <laughs> single game. Another really fun gambling story is that back in the 90s when teams didn't have private jets, uh, the team would have to fly commercial and they'd have to check their luggage. So Michael Jordan bet everyone on his team that when their check bags came out of the machine in baggage claim, that his would be put first because he's Michael Jordan and they're going to treat him special. So he bet all of his teammates hundreds of dollars. Uh, and of course, his bags came out first because before the flight, he bribed the crew a bunch of money to put his bags out first when they landed. That's amazing. So Michael Jordan used to gamble a lot and also used to cheat in his gambling a lot. So he's a very prolific gambler. It's not even that Michael Jordan wants to gamble. It's that he wants to gamble and win, which is a which is a yes, lot more because he's so like competitive him as a player. And also, this thing that he did would tri has trickled down to the modern NBA now. Like Kobe Bryant is the is would be like the disciple or the follow up. I mean, just in terms mm -hmm. of like, listen, Chubes, I hear you, I see your your Knicks face getting stanky, but. <laughs> no, 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 well, no, like no. This, uh, this idea of that whoever is the best person in the NBA also needs to be hyper focused and hyper competitive and be cutthroat and also like mm -hmm. do this to his teammates. This isn't even just Michael Jordan messing with other people. This is Michael Jordan messing with his coworkers. When you think of it like that, imagine one of your coworkers was like, hey, I bet I can uh, I can throw this um, piece of paper into this garbage can. And yeah, I'll bet you twenty dollars. And then he has it fixed and he bets you that every Monday for like an entire year. Like, no, I'm going to go to HR by 5th and be like, sorry, um, Steven keeps stealing my money, and I don't appreciate it. So, wait, you're going to go to HR because you're gambling with your coworker at Lucas I don't think that's how He's HR works. It, like, if you somehow, like, put a string on the piece of paper. Th but I don't think HR deals in gambling-related, like, incidents, whether or not they're fixed or not. Hey, HR is fine with everybody playing fantasy football. That's just gambling I, with style. <laughs> March Madness. I no, I agree. I agree. HR for the most part would not care that you're gambling. I don't think they're gonna <laughs> step in if one coworker <laughs> is fixing it on another. They're not like the law when it comes to inner coworker uh, gambling. Yeah, Steven <laughs> um, was betting me uh, money a lot, and I kept losing. And also, he drew penises on the piece of paper, and it was really. Now, now, the second part, you might have something to go on. And it was just like, it's not a really safe work environment, and I need to stop losing $20 because then I have to buy him so much Chipotle. And it's just making my work environment really tough. Okay, anyway, so there are also <laughs> some instances of Michael Jordan gambling that was like more problematic. So the first couple had to deal with him and golfing. So he was a big golfer and used to gamble with the friends that he would play with. And at one point, he was found that he wrote a $57,000 check to a guy by the name of Slim Buller, who is a golf shop owner and also a drug mule for a local kingpin. Uh, Jordan first lied that it was a loan, but then the, the situation went to trial uh, because of trouble that Slim Buller got into. And he had to on he had to testify that it was because of gambling stuff. Slim Buller sounds like the name of someone from The Wire. Like David Simon's like, yeah, man, I knew like a Ooh, guy named Slim yeah. Buller back in my old days. I really want to give him a shout out and put him <laughs> in the wire. <laughs> so like he was giving him money because he was was he like a bookie for Jordan or like yeah, why was something Jordan about giving that. him the money? Something 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 in regards to that. Slim Buller had connections to being a bookie. Because that's the perfect name for a man who's a bookie runs a golf shop and is also a drug mule. It's like yeah, the perfect it's the name best for name that ever. combo. Oh, like yeah. you like it's such an unbelievable three things. I guess two of those are very illegal, so I guess those go but together. Then golf shop but then owner. you just add in like golf shop owner, you're like, yeah, yeah, what a perfect name for this man. Eddie Dow had he was in a similar type of thing where he was involved in drugs and betting and and maf you know not good people right. type stuff like i don't want to say he's in the mafia but it's like mafia-esque where he was murdered because he owed a lot of people money and when they came upon his estate after he was killed they found checks written to him by michael jordan that totaled one hundred eight thousand dollars all just weird gambling type stuff. The final one of which was a book was written called Michael and Me by Richard 
at, I think it's pronounced equine, but it's or equina, but it's spelled esquinas, e s q u i n a s. So I'm really playing the role of Julia here. I'm gonna go with like Richard Esquina, uh, and I have no idea. Um, so I'm really Juliaing it up. I'm I'm so excited for everyone on Twitter to be like, uh, actually, Richard's my brother, and the last name is pronounced uh, Richard's like my this. uncle, and Michael Jorbin <laughs> is a very close family friend. <laughs> It's weird how many of Zeus's relatives are on Twitter and will at reply us when we get the names of the Greek gods wrong. Yeah, you know, it's you're very strange. The... Oh, dang it. I'm pl- oh, man, I'm playing the role of Julia, and I said the Boston Celtics, and I really told myself all week that I was going to pronounce it the Boston Celtics, and I forgot. <laughs> no. <laughs> so anyway, R- Richard insert last name, uh, wrote a book called Michael and Me, and he revealed that at one point in time, Michael Jordan or, or owed him $902,000 from golf gambling bets because they would just bet a lot per hole and then there'd be double or nothings involved, all sorts of stuff like that. These gambling things, the golf ones, had come to light and pe- and they were kind of like meddling on the surface. But the big one that actually caused a problem was during the 1993 Eastern Conference Finals, which is the round prior to the NBA Finals. He was playing against my beloved New York Knicks. And at one time during these during the playoff series, the night before a game, he was found gambling in Atlantic City, New Jersey until 2.30 in the morning. Now, I don't know if you guys know where Atlantic City is, but it's in, like, southern New Jersey. So, to, And they were their next game, that, like, later in that day uh, at, you know, 8 p.m. or whatever, was in New York. So the earliest he could have gotten back to his hotel in New York is probably 4 in the morning. So he's basically out until 4 in the morning gambling and not necessarily, you know, winding down and relaxing. He's probably drinking lots of alcohol, smoking cigars, gambling, taking, you know doing whatever not the most not the healthiest stuff and then supposed to play a basketball game later that day and of course they lost and this became this whole big hubbub where it was like oh my gosh if michael wasn't gambling so much i bet he would have played better and they would have won the game so this is kind of tied to what we said before um about the only time that people actually step in is because of business reasons I mean, there have been plenty of stories where people, where NBA players have gone out all night and then were super hungover and then played anyway. I mean, especially in the 80s, like before athletes like really took care of their bodies and it was like a whole thing about um, their health and like their brand. Plenty of people have done this. But as you're going to see, like because it happened in the Eastern Conference Finals and it was on, this was the game six, game seven. It w- no, okay, it was, well, it was still, game three. I mean, the, so the fact it was still is- early on, on, but still, it's in one of the most important rounds of the playoffs, and it is the number one player in right. the league. Like it's so the playoffs. It Michael Jordan out. draws everybody. This is going to be a nationally televised game. It's still everything that happens is because business people are stepping in to do something. How many championships has Jordan and the Bulls won? At this so point? at this point, they had just won their third in a row. So in a they row, in, right. in, in, this is 1993. They go on to win the finals that year. So right. that is their third consecutive NBA finals, which is very rare. Very few teams have ever done that. So Michael Jordan is the best player in the league by far. He is on the best team in the league by far. And during that offseason, a month before the season starts in early October, he decides that he's going to retire from the NBA. And he lists two reasons for it, both of which I think are not the real reason. And the conspiracy theory is what is the real reason why he retired? Because why would you retire if you were the greatest player on the greatest team at the peak of your fame? Why would you leave the NBA? The two reasons that Michael Jordan cites, the first of which is that he just kind of got bored with the competition. He just thought it got stale and he was growing, you know, there was no real rival to him. No one could really step to him. And he cited that as one of the reasons that he retired. Now, going much better competition in golf at that point. <laughs> well, he goes on to play minor league baseball, which is also baseball. Interesting. Yeah, that, but... but like seeing how how he would do anything to win things as silly as dumb bets with his teammates i think that this is completely false because if he's in a situation where he can still be competitive and still win there's no way he would want to leave i think that's complete fabrication true true true. the other reason that he lists, and this is a little more unfortunate is that it has to do with the death of his father so his father that summer three months prior had passed away his father was murdered in an attempted robbery so his father was like over at a rest stop um driving back from a trip 
And these guys uh, came into the rest stop and tried to rob the stuff out of his car while um, he was sleeping in the in the front seat at the rest stop. And he woke up uh, and they shot him. And that so it's like super unfortunate just that his, his father was murdered. Terrible. His father had always envisioned Michael as a professional baseball player. Michael Jordan played baseball growing up. He was good, but not as good as basketball. His father, James Jordan, um, I think had a minor league baseball career as well. I don't think he ever went on to play in the majors, but he had a stint with professional baseball. Um, so Jordan's second reason reasoning for retiring was so that he could pursue a career in baseball. Jordan goes on to play in the Chicago White Sox minor league team, which was owned by the same guy who owned the Bulls. So he had like a clear in to get on a team. Those are the two reasons he lists. Um, even though it sounds really flimsy to us now, I mean, imagine the best player in the entire and all of sports, really, the best at what he or mm-hmm. she does, goes up and says these two reasons. I mean, he, he I remember watching a few videos where he would do these press conferences and he's talked about his dad. And of course, like there's genuine emotion there because uh, his dad just passed away. When we're talking about mm-hmm. sports, I mean, we can't discount um, like all these ideas of fathers and sons and masculinity. Like if he says it's going to be mm-hmm. about his dad, who's going to step to him and tell him that fulfilling this, this wish that his dad had for him is not a reason. And I mean, it's not even like he, he wished that like he would have been like a professional figure skater, like something that maybe was less, that was like <laughs> less masculine or doing something less athletic, like going and doing a business or something that he didn't have history doing. Right. He and like, but it's up. still tied. Like it's still sports. It's still something that he's skilled at or in theory skilled at. And it's still in Chicago. So these still ideas of who we know of Michael Jordan, uh, like it can still tie into this idea that we have about um, like sports and um, professional sports players. Yes. And the other thing is that it could be a valid reason I just don't think that it is the reason that pushed him over the edge, uh, and I will get to. So it could have been like a factor and something that he may have been thinking about doing um, because, you know, we all grieve in different ways. But what I think is the true reason, and it just could have piggybacked onto these other things, uh, was had to do with his gambling stuff. So after his... Eastern Conference final Atlantic City thing got a bunch of news. The NBA opened an official investigation into Michael Jordan's gambling problem because they wanted to first check off and make sure he wasn't doing a Pete Rose situation where he was gambling on his own team or his own performance because then you get into integrity issues. They wanted also to make sure he wasn't doing anything illegal, and they also just wanted to make sure if he was okay and if they needed help. So they launched this official... Um, investigation into his gambling problems. And that's fine, and that seems normal. But what is not fine and what does not seem normal is that three days after he announced his retirement, the investigation was dropped, and they said they found nothing conclusive to point to any gambling issues with Michael Jordan, which seems super fishy. Like, three days. So was it, like, designed to get him out and like it was kind of like you know what's coming so we're gonna do this so like so it's hard to go it's, hide for a little bit or yeah or so what? so it's hard to say and here is one reason a lot of people think that david stern as we've mentioned shady guy still commissioner of the nba at this point same guy from the 1985 story he probably or people believe that he went up to michael jordan and said hey um we have this investigation going on we don't want to find you guilty because at this point in time michael jordan is the nba like he is the reason that it is so popular in the 90s he's the best player everyone loves to watch him it's similar to lebron but if there was just no one even close to being as popular to lebron like there's no steph curry or kevin durant where people love watching them it's just it's michael jordan and everyone else and if you if it's found that he has a serious gambling issue and maybe has nba integrity gambling issues that just ruins the league. So it's in David Stern's interest to kind of make this not an issue. So the the reason that people think David Stern had a hand in this is because during Michael Jordan's initial press conference where he announces his retirement, he hints at coming back into the league. He mentions that this baseball thing might just be temporary, could just be an experiment that he wants to do just to see how it goes. And he says, you know, who know he says, who knows, maybe later down the road, Quote, if David Stern will have me back in the league, 
I'll play basketball again. So he mentions, if the Chicago Bulls want me, if my teammates want to play with me, and quote, if David Stern lets me back into the league, which is ridiculous wording for a situation in which, like, there's no reason why he would bring that up. He's the most popular person ever. If he wants to be back in the league, there's no one that is going to say no to him. And David Stern doesn't ever not let people in the league. That's not how the league works. If a team signs you, you play. So for him to say that makes it kind of think that David Stern might have had a hand in him stepping away from basketball for two years. Also, like, I don't watch a ton of, like, basketball press conferences or sports press conferences in general, but I feel like you typically don't name the commissioner. Oh, very rarely. Very off. The commissioner is pretty much only discussed when we're talking about, like, some kind of outside thing mm-hmm. or the, the these players did this and Roger Goodell has made a statement. Sure. I can't remember the, the current Adam NBA Silver. Name. It's Adam Silver. It's, I knew it was Silver. I couldn't remember the first name. Is he your brother, Eric? Is Yo, he your up? brother? <laughs> Adam Silver is my second cousin and I'm going to bald like him and you better get on my level. No, he's not my second cousin. Keep up shoes. Yeah. Hey, I don't know, man. <laughs> you both live in New York. You both like basketball. <laughs> Clearly, there can be a conspiracy. I'm related to Adam Silver. <laughs> <laughs> we busted. This is the first time we've had breaking, breaking news. news. Conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So like, it seems very odd that he would call out the commissioner by name. Like that yes. doesn't that doesn't happen. It's weird to drop him by name, and it's weird just to say the phrase "if David Stern would have me back in the league." It's just it's not like a normal phrase that people just happen to casually say. It's it's so that just seems odd was jordan like particularly humble like was i don't i don't really remember his oh no oh my god michael michael jordan was one of the biggest trash talkers in the world right he was he was crazy so like like this idea of like this humble part of like oh if he'll have me back it's like like jordan knew how good he was oh yes (laughs) like there's no reason he would be like "Mm, maybe like i guess if i could get back (laughs) into basketball i'll take another shot at it yeah no he's not not a humble man in the slightest so basically he goes on to play minor league baseball for a year and a half and he misses the entire 93 94 season for the Birmingham, the Birmingham Barons. Yes, the Birmingham Barons, who are the Chicago White Sox minor league team. Misses the entire 93-94 season, misses most of the 94-95 season, and then plays the last, I think, like 10 games and then the entire playoffs in 1995. Uh, doesn't win the championship that year, but then they go on to win three more consecutively uh, the following years, and he goes back to his amazing basketball abilities. Now, Shubes, I want to take this away from you for a little bit because I did some research that I want to show you. This is so prolific. It's so like part of the pop culture arena that this becomes oh, yes. part of a burgeoning little media market called video games. In 1994, mm-hmm. the uh, <laughs> EA, <laughs> EA Electronic Arts gets the rights to Michael Jordan. Oh, I did not know this game was made by EA. Gets the rights to Michael Jordan and creates the game Michael Jordan, colon, Chaos in the Windy City. (laughs) This is for Super Nintendo. Uh, Here, uh, you guys don't have the box (laughs) art in front of me, but here it is. Uh, Michael Jordan is just like... Oh, I've seen it. (laughs) The the name Michael Jordan is like the most text-arted thing possible, and Chaos in the Windy City is just like italicized, like stuck next to him. Uh, Michael Jordan looks extremely pained, like you are during like your sixth grade uh, school picture. He's just like the grimace on his face, and he's holding two basketballs, one Mm -hmm. in each hand. One is on fire, and one is covered in ice. Check the show notes for a picture of this cover art. Now, Eric, I just want to I'm going to quickly read you the plot to this uh, to this game. (laughs) It is two sentences, I promise. Okay. a little before the Scotty Pippen charity game. (laughs) Let's just start. Let's start there. Scott, remember Scotty Pippen, his best friend on this on the Bulls. Yes. Also got the rights to Scotty <laughs> Pippen, apparently. A little before the Scotty Pippen charity game, Michael Jordan's teammates are abducted by the mad scientist Maximus Cranium. The protagonist must save them before it's Big too brain. late. That's it. <laughs> that's it. That, that's it. And what basically, what game was this? Oh, it was like a side scroller yeah. video game. 
<laughs> so this is like similar to Michael yes, Jackson's Moonwalker. Ex- yeah, exactly like that. Mm-hmm. But Video instead game. of dancing and throwing his hat, Michael Jordan had different like types of basketballs that he could throw at people. Mm-hmm. He could also dunk as a secondary I love attack. It. Um, this is also extremely important that um, at the time, GamePro gave the game a positive review. <laughs> but even though it was blatant product Whoa. placement, they still said it was actually pretty fun and had some complex levels. But later in, 19- in September 1997, Nintendo Power voted on the 10 worst games of all time. And uh, this we're talking about like this is right at this is after the video game crater in the early in the late eighties, early nineties, yeah. where like they made the worst games of all time. Michael Jordan, colon, Chaos in the Windy City, placed at seventh worst game of all time. Uh, the game was not no the article said the, the game was bad. not too poor, but it was a waste of a license. <laughs> Wow. Oh, my goodness. So it got it because of lost opportunity. My favorite thing about it is that, as Eric mentioned, you're, one of your secondary attacks is to dunk a basketball. But there has to you have to be at a point in the level where there's a rim <laughs> and a backboard. So the no. bad guys who have stolen all of Michael Jordan's basketball playing teammates put it, installed a bunch of rims and backboards into their evil lair so that Michael Jordan can do his super move, which is to dunk, and then, like, everyone in the level dies. <laughs> Listen, like, even even villains, even ridiculous. super villains, need to abide by the Geneva Convention, where you need to give your prisoners something to do, <laughs> and they're basketball players, and they need basketball oh hoops, obviously. <laughs> So this is oh just to goodness. say, this is just to Isn't say that, that this was such a, a thing. Yeah. Like, this wasn't just restrained to basketball. The fact that Michael Jordan took time off for a mm-hmm. year and a half, like, was part of the public knowledge enough that they, like, got the license for Michael Jordan that he was not playing basketball at the time. And it also could add to the conspiracy theory that Michael Jordan was very much okay with his absence from basketball, the reasoning behind it being construed in a bunch of different ways so that the real story might get lost because Space Jam was about it. This video game is about it. Like, there's all these other things that happen to deal with why did Michael Jordan leave? So that could play into the conspiracy that he doesn't want anyone to really know why he left. And the, and the whole thing of getting a, an athlete just to step away for a couple months to let some sort of investigation wash away has worked in the past. And most recently, it worked with women's tennis. So you know how Maria Sharapova and Azarenka grunt really loudly when they play tennis? It's like the, ooh, ooh, like of course. all that annoying stuff. There was a, the, the USTA was going to make the line judges wear decibel monitors around their necks. And if they grunted at a certain level, if it was too loud, the, they would have automatically lost the point. And this was getting a lot of traction until Maria Sharapova was kicked out of the league for two years for steroids. And Azarenka was pregnant and took two years of maternity leave. And once they were out of the league, they stopped developing that whole thing because nobody cared anymore. And now that they're back in the league, people are starting to think about doing it again. So the whole just step away and let this kind of wash away technique works. And that's what the conspiracy centers on David, you know, that David Stern did to Michael Jordan said, just go away. Let this whole gambling thing kind of everyone will forget about it. Everyone will just talk about the fact that you've left and that you're bad at baseball and that why would you leave basketball? They'll worry about that for two years. You come back. Everything's fine. You stop gambling. You get your S word together and uh, you're good to go. So I don't know. I'm not yeah. really sure why you censored that yourself. That is the Michael there. Jordan conspiracy. You just got too heated. I want to. I forgot. I yeah. know that spirits. You swear is... on this podcast and you swear on your own podcast. I, okay. I well, was... you know, I want to give a good. I want people to think I'm... No, I don't. I, I curse so much on Potterless. Mike, thank you so much for these NBA myths, conspiracies, stories. Uh, very different for spirits, but also really, really interesting stuff. So where can uh, everybody find you? I thought it was loose enough to fit into the myth thing. Oh, everyone can find me at this fun little podcast that I've got called Potterless, which is the journey of a grown adult, me, reading Harry Potter for the first time. Basically, I'd never read Harry Potter at all until I was 24, and then I picked up the books and started making a podcast about it. So every episode is me going over like three to five chapters of Harry Potter, and I just go through the plot without any sort of uh, rose-tinted glasses or nostalgia factor. I will call out things that don't make sense, like the fact that Sirius Black, a convicted murderer of 13 people, was found in the school, and they didn't send the kids home. They just got hall monitors. So I'll make fun of stuff like that. And the, pers- the people that are on the podcast are always Harry Potter experts. 
many of which uh, the the entire Spirits team has been on, and Eric's, yes. Eric Silver is to be on a future episode. So a whole bunch of good guests there that know a lot about Harry Potter, so you get a good uh, dichotomy of I know nothing and they know everything. And I'm super biased, but I think it's a fun time. So yeah, Potterless. Where can people find you just generally on the oh, internet? Oh, potterlesspodcast.com is there uh, for all of those podcast things. But if you want to find just me, uh, I'm at shubes17, S-C-H-U-B-E-S-1-7 on all of those social medias. And Eric, tell us about yourself and join the party. Um, er- Eric, would you like to thank me for all of my good color commentary that I made? I Also, <laughs> Eric, thank you for joining us as well. And tell us all about where we can find you and join the party. What up? Okay. Um, I am one of four producers of the D&D storytelling and collaborative storytelling podcast, Join the Party. Uh, we're creative, we're fun, we play Dungeons and Dragons, but it's for gaming veterans and beginners alike. It's character focused. We have a lot of crazy things going on and I am the dungeon master. So I'm just like, keep coming up with crazy things. And, uh, Amanda, who you might know from Spirits and Brandon and Fish, uh, the players just respond to it and we have a really, really good time. If uh, fantasy evangelists, uh, robot detectives, and uh, queer, cool teens uh, appeal to you, uh, I think this is a place that you can check us out. So we are Join the Party. You can find us on iTunes or our website at jointhepartypod.com. If you want to find me, I am at L underscore Silvero at pretty much everything. You can hit me up on Twitter I'm at EL underscore Silver O. Nice. You can find me pretty much everywhere at I'm Eric Schneider and you can find Spirits at Spirits Podcast on Twitter and SpiritsPodcast.com and I don't know how to end the podcast because typically we do kind of creepy, kind of cool but now we should do something basketball related. Uh, praise be to Chris Apps Porzingis. <laughs> Jesus. Our Lord and Savior. Kristaps <laughs> Porzingis sounds like a myth from uh, from Eastern from Europe. From Latvia? Yeah, he's really a does. seven. He, really he is does. a seven foot three Latvian man, which is pretty much he's a, a Latvian Eastern unicorn European myth. Who, ble- who blesses the American an American folk folk hero? God, I love him. Kind of dunky, kind of cool. <laughs> kind of dunky, kind of cool. Well, kind of dunky, kind of cool. We'll be back with a normal episode of Spirits <laughs> next week. Come on and slam, oh, and welcome and to welcome jam. to Spears Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we should have started it with that. Come on and slam, and welcome to Spears Podcast. I'm Eric Schneider. Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafini, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us on Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, and Instagram at Spirits Podcast. We also have all our episodes, collaborations, and guest appearances, plus merch on our website, spiritspodcast.com. Come on over to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash spiritspodcast for all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. Throw us as little as $1 and get access to audio extras, recipe cards, director's commentaries, and patron-only live streams. And hey, if you like the show, please share us with your friends. That is the best way to help us keep on growing. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time.